Hey guys, happy Sunday morning to you. Thank you for letting me come into your home. Hey, at the end of the service, I'm gonna tell you more about this, but just so you know, it's Holy Week. Today's Palm Sunday. All week, we're gonna have prayer gatherings here at noon and 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Uh, Friday evening, we have a taquisa, an outdoor uh, taco party, and we need to know how many people you're bringing so we can have enough, the tacos are on us. Uh, we just need to know how many people so we can prepare and have all the tacos to feed everybody. That's at 5.30, 7 p.m. on Good Friday. Uh, after we fill ourselves with taco, then, then warm uh, and, and full, we're gonna come in here for our 7 p.m. Uh, Good Friday service, a dramatic reading and telling and singing of, of the story of Holy Week. Uh, and then Easter Sunday morning, 11 a.m., we're gonna have our service. What I need for you to do, and I'm gonna tell you more about this at the end, but I need for you to go to the website and register for the taco party so we know how many tacos to buy. Uh, I need for you to be inviting your friends to Good Friday. We'll get more tacos, just bring them. And I need you to, to, to be inviting your friends to our Sunday morning Easter celebration. Maybe they don't normally go to church. Say, come to our church, it's cool, it's a rocking service. It's gonna be awesome and quick and, and fairly short and, and we'll all have a good time together. So that's what I need for you to do. And now let's get rolling with today's service. Good morning. Today marks the beginning of an important season for us. The next seven days we call Holy Week. Today's Palm Sunday, and each day we take a step closer to the cross and the crucifixion and ultimately Christ's resurrection, his walking out of the tomb and defeating death. So today's an important day as we begin the most high, holy, special celebration for us as a church, and that is Easter. Christmas is important because it points to Easter and all that Christ has done for us. The difference is no one's going to help you with Easter. There are no presents under the tree, no ornaments. Uh, there is no help from society and, and culture for us. And so we at River Church, we want to help you really breathe deeply in this season and, and, and experience fully the wonder and the majesty of what Christ has done for us through his work on the cross. So today begins Holy Week with Palm Sunday. And on Palm Sunday, we celebrate Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on a little donkey. And I've always been so confused by how this is a triumph. How is this a triumphal entry? How is his going to the cross to be bu uh, brutally executed a triumph? Well, it is. And today we're gonna address that. It's Palm Sunday of the year 2021. And so we're gonna look at actually two stories of Jesus making a grand entrance. Two stories, one is the Palm Sunday story that's already taken place, this historic event, his, his march into Jerusalem on that, that Passover weekend, uh, that, 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 that celebration, that festive event. But before we look at that, we're going to look at another story in the book of Revelation. It is, a, it is a triumphal entry, a grand entrance that Jesus will one day make on a white steed, a large white horse, uh, and that grand entry is yet to happen. It's going to happen soon. In fact, the next time we see Jesus eye to eye, face to face, this is what he's going to look like. That's what that story tells us. So we're going to look at these two uh, somewhat contrasting circumstances, and yet they're both stories of Jesus making this beautiful, triumphal entry into our lives. So we're gonna look at the Palm Sunday story, but first, let's look at the Revelation story, the grand entrance that's yet to come, the one that we can look forward to. All right, now the book of Revelation, chapter 19, uh, John is the writer, and he has had this heavenly uh, experience, this vision in which the Lord gives him a picture of what is yet to come, and here's how it goes. The story of Jesus coming back on the scene, making a grand entrance. Verse 11, it says, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and the one sitting on it is called, here's the name of Jesus, Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges 
In righteousness he makes war. His eyes, they're like flame of fire on his head or many diadems. And he has, he has a name written. On his head is a name written. And it says, a name that no one knows but himself. It's a mystery. Jesus knows this name. Verse 13, he is clothed in a robe dipped in, robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is, here's another name for Jesus, the word of God. Verse 14, in the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, linen, white and pure, were following him also on white horses. This is a grand parade, a majestic parade for a king. Verse 15, from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which uh, to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his, on Jesus' robe, and on his thigh, he has a name written. And what is that name? It is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It's written. It's, it's printed. Is it a tattoo? I, I don't know. But it's on his robe. It's, it's, on his, it's on his leg. King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Now, I was thinking this week, what language is it going to be written in? I'm thinking maybe not English. So I thought I'd give you, here's, here's the Greek, the language of the day, the, the original language of, of the New Testament, what, what Jesus would have spoken that day. Basileus, Basileon, Kai meaning and, Kurios, Kurion. King of kings and Lord of lords. Perhaps written in Greek, I don't know. Perhaps, perhaps printed on the robe, perhaps tattooed on his thigh. But he comes, we hear the thunder of the mighty horses, the white horses. Jesus comes in majesty, he comes in fury. He comes as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That is one day. That is what we have. have uh, we look forward to. Uh, we will have the privilege of experiencing in awe and in wonder one day. But what does it mean? What does it mean that Jesus is King of Kings? That he's Lord of Lords? I mean, maybe you've heard, heard, heard it said that Jesus wants to be he wants to be your king. He wants to be your lord. He wants to be your master. What does that mean? I remember as a little boy, with fondness, I remember as a little boy, an elementary age boy, growing up in the, in the Baptist church, I remember this diagram that they would draw. It was like a stick figure um, chair, like a two-dimensional stick figure chair. <clears throat> and that is to represent the throne in my heart. You know, a throne, like where a king sits. If we weren't doing this on, on camera today, I'd put a chair, and later on today when we worship here together, I'll put a, put a chair down and I'll sit on it. And, and, and like a throne, like a little chair in my heart. And, and, and my, my, my dear teachers would explain to me that Jesus is either on the throne of your heart, he's sitting there as king, as lord, as boss, or he is, he is not. And if he is not, then, then perhaps it's, you know, sitting on the throne of your heart is your boyfriend or your girlfriend. Or, or maybe it, you've made too much of your spouse and your spouse rules your heart solely. Maybe you've made your kids like, like gods, like little G gods, and that's, that's all that life is about for you. Or, you know, maybe... Maybe it's what you did on the, just yesterday on Saturday, your hobbies. And that rules your heart. It rules your affection. It's what you're all about. It wakes you up in the morning. Maybe it's your business. And it, as life has turned out, like that's all you live for. Uh, you, you, perhaps it's your career, your wealth. Perhaps it's your car. Perhaps it's your house. But there's, there's something that... That, 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 that sits on the throne of your heart. It's your king. It's, it's, it's your Lord. And, and, and what does it mean to say that Christ is king? And what does it mean when, he, when the, the absence of Christ as king? Well, I think we know what that means. The absence of Christ as king means that something else is king. Like what my, what my affections burn white hot for. There's something there's something in that, that throne room of your heart. Uh, something that, that sits on that throne and your affections, they burn white hot for that one thing, that one 
person. If it's not Jesus, it's something else. And today we're going to try and figure out what that is. Who's the king of your heart? Okay, now, we're talking about Jesus being king of kings and lord of lords. And we've looked at that future one day uh, majestic entrance that Jesus will make. Now let's go back in history and let's look at the Palm Sunday uh, entrance into Jerusalem. It's, it's, it's Passover, which is the, a big feast for, for the nation of Israel. Hundreds of thousands or maybe over a million uh, people would come to, to, to the, the, the city, the, this metropolis, uh, Jerusalem. The temple was there. All the festivities were there. And that is the weekend on which, that is the, the time period in which God determined that Jesus be crucified. The largest crowd that could possibly be amassed in that day for the Passover. And that's what's going on here. People are in town. Jesus is about to come to town. It's a frantic, frenetic, exciting, exciting sort of event. John 12, verse 9. Jesus is not yet in Jerusalem. He's staging. He's getting ready. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was, was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, you know, Lazarus, the one whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So the chief priests, the religious people, they made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. They'd already decided to kill Jesus and kill Lazarus too, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus, he's coming to Jerusalem. Jesus is coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and they went out to meet him crying, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a, a young donkey, and he sat on it, just as it is written, Old Testament prophetic passage quoted here, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt, not a white horse, but a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. Verse 17, the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. He'd actually brought a man back from dead. Verse 19, so the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. So the summary, pretty simple. Jesus is king. He's not a king. He's not one of many kings. He is the king. King, written on his thigh, written on his robe in Revelation, he is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. He he affirms it. Jesus doesn't shrink back from that. Uh, and, and now the the religious people of that day in this historical event, the the councils, their worst fear, fears are now realized. It happens at the time of the Passover for the whole world to see. Jesus is King, but. But this is a rather hollow inauguration because in just a few days, they're going to renounce his kingship. They're going to say, no, you, you're not going to be king of our hearts after all. And why? Because he is not willing to fit their expectations. It's like Jesus says to them and to us, I will be your king, but not that kind of king. Uh, the, the, the big question, I guess, is so what sort of preconceived expectations do I have of Jesus and his lordship in my life that he never, ever expects to fulfill? What do I expect of Jesus that he has no intention of fulfilling? Well, well on that day, they, they, they renounced his 
kingship. I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but they renounced his kingship because he would not be the kind of king that they wanted. I don't, however, allow the confusion of the crowd and, and the confusion of the disciples rob me of the wonder and, and, and the awe of this intentional, prophetic, triumphal entry that Jesus determines it's going to happen now. It's time. For, 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 many, for several years, he'd been saying it's, it's not yet time. It's not yet time. But now he decides on this day, this week, this celebration, it's time. This event, Jewish, uh, Jesus' triumphal entry, it was staged by God. That, that's my point. You see, the Jews were not even allowed to celebrate Passover in their local communities. They were obligated to travel to Jerusalem, keep the feast at the central sanctuary in Jerusalem. There's a Jewish historian named Josephus, uh, and he estimated Passover attendance in AD 64 and then AD 65 to be approximately 2.7 million Jews. So, so possibly in Jesus' day, when, when he makes his triumphal entry, potentially there were millions of people that, that heard, had some sense of an idea that something's going on. And so they take, they take branches, palm branches, right? And they throw them on the... Why palm branches? Have you ever wondered that? I used to wonder that. Well, we know this. During the intertestamental time, which is between the Old Testament and the New Testament, palm branch parades became a tradition. Sometimes Jesus comes on the scene. Uh, that, it's already a tradition. They know what it means, the people. It's like if you're in New York City, like a ticker tape parade in the middle of the 20th century when someone won the war, won the Super Bowl, won the World Series. Uh, it's like that type of a parade. They, they knew what they were doing. It was not like the first time they'd ever had a palm branch parade. Uh, this type of parade, in fact, had become for the nation uh, for the nation of Israel, as they lived under this Roman rule, they, they weren't completely free as a nation. For the nation of Israel, this, this, this palm branch parade had become a very traditional, a very significant sign. It, it was actually a symbol of military might, triumph, victory. And we read this story as like an oddity, like what's up with the palm branches? But they knew exactly what they were doing. It was significant, it was traditional, and, and it, it meant something in that day. Palm branches, in fact, had become a national symbol of victory to the point that the nation considered minting coins with the palm branch on them. And it, and it had become a sign of revolt against Rome uh, in, the, in the 60s AD history records tell us that. So, so they took these palm branches, they threw them down, and they, they, they had these, these certain psalms, uh, songs within their, their religious tradition called Hallel Psalms. And every morning they would sing these Hallel Psalms and, and they went like this. They went, save us, save us now. Here's the point. The point is, every Jewish pilgrim in that day was familiar with these words, these psalms, the, the palm branch symbol. Every Jewish pilgrim was familiar with this type of parade and all the symbols that went with it. And so these words are they're quite naturally what they use, these psalms. Everybody knew the, the words, the symbols, the palms dropping on the ground. They knew this is what you do. You do when a military conqueror is coming home, you throw him a parade. And so in a military sense, they're yelling, save us, Jesus, save us, because they, they think he's the Messiah, but they, they misunderstand his intentions. They think he's going to save us from, from Roman rule. He's going to set up a new kingdom. Uh, and, and, and so what happens next is particularly odd. It's, it's awkward, in fact. Don't, don't miss the awkwardness. In verse 14, it says, And Jesus found a young donkey, and he sat on it, just as it is written, quote, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. A 
a donkey. Not a white, trusty steed, a donkey. Donkeys in the Middle East in that day, they're so small that a grown man would have to bend his knees to keep from dragging his feet on the ground when riding such a tiny little animal. And Jesus says, get the donkey. Bring the donkey. Let's, let's just embrace the fact for a moment that this is an awkward scene. No, no military chariot, no uh, victorious king uh, sort of a scene going on here. Not even a full-grown donkey. Jesus did just what Zechariah in the Old Testament had prophesied, had predicted. He brings peace. He brings an awkward, awkward, unfamiliar sort of peace. He doesn't ride in on the military uh, chariot horse sort of ride that, that we expect him. Instead, he comes in on this little beast of burden, this little symbol of peace, a small baby donkey. And again, in this awkward moment, as we hear perhaps Jesus' feet dragging through the desert dust. It's, just, it's as if he is saying once again, I will be your king, but not that kind of king. I, I am God, the Father's promised Messiah. I come in lowliness. I come in meekness. I come in humility. I come bringing peace do you understand that, that, that our King, our Lord, that he represents lowliness and, and meekness and, and humility and, and, and peace? And Jesus says on that day, I won't bow to your agendas. And so they crucify him. Five days later, he's not the king they're looking for, not the kind of king they're looking for. So, so he, they crucify him. Now, Jesus affirms his kingship, uh, just not the kind of kingship that, 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 that they thought he would be. Not the kind of conqueror, not the kind of military might, not the type of king that they had conjured up in their own minds. And don't we do the same? Don't we conjure up our own thoughts of what Jesus ought to be like? what he ought to give. What, how, you know, he ought to come through, he ought to deliver, he ought to be this kind of king. And, and Jesus won't bow to our agendas. And they, don't, they didn't get it on that day, and we don't get it often in our own day. And, and, and in, in the Gospel of John, we read it in verse 16, John's editorial comment, he, he mentions not even the disciples on that day really understood what was going on because nobody got Jesus then they didn't get what he was about um, but that did not temper or diminish their enthusiasm right they still threw a party they didn't get him they they were expecting something very different but but they still they still were enthusiastic and and we're like that I mean some of us have no more made Jesus Lord of our lives than, you know, the man on the moon. But that has not tempered our enthusiasm, and that's a dangerous place to live. Listen, just, just mere enthusiasm regarding Jesus, really, sometimes it doesn't mean a thing. Curiosity and and false expectations, and like if the disciples in that day, at least for the moment, if they missed it, they didn't even get Jesus. The crowd really, they really missed, missed it. Didn't understand. There's like a mob mentality. A group speak took over that day. And they were excited bunch. Excited by Jesus' potential. Uh, I mean, he raised a dead man like Lazarus is right there. What might he possibly do for us? But the scary thing is they missed the point altogether. And so Jesus brings peace. An awkward kind of peace. He did not come to serve their agenda, my agenda, your agenda. He says, I will be your king. 
Maybe not the kind of king that, that, that you think I ought to be, but I will be your king. And just a few days later, he's questioned. He's questioned by a Roman military commander who says, are you, in fact, king of the Jews? You see the theme today, right? Jesus is king. Jesus is Lord. Pilate, he, he holds Jesus' very life and death in his hands at that moment, this Roman military man. And he says to Jesus, are you king of the Jews? And Jesus in John chapter 18 says this. It says, Jesus answered him, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not of or not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. And Jesus answered, You say that I am king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Jesus never shrinks back from this title of, of king, king of kings, lord of lords. He embraces it fully. The crowd expected, I don't know, chariots, horses, maybe a camel, you know, like the accepted modes of transportation for royalty of that day. Pilate, this military commander, just a few days earlier, Pilate had ridden in with great pomp and fanfare on a military steed. And then here's Jesus on a baby colt. And they did not warmly welcome Jesus' humility. They did not want, know what to do with a humble king. He is king. He, he's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. And yet he brings, he comes in humility. And they didn't know what to do with that. So they crucify him. Before I become too hard and judgmental of the people of that day who, who really missed the point of, of why Jesus had, had even come to this earth, I really need to look deep within inside my own soul and say, have I fashioned a different sort of Jesus in my own soul, in my own heart, in my own affections? Have I determined that Jesus wants to be and do things for me that he never intended to do? Uh, you know, within humanity, it seems like we've gotten it mostly backwards. We've missed the point. We think that Jesus wants to be a conduit to all the stuff that I really want to worship. Like Jesus might give me health and wealth and prosperity and a new, a better business, a new job, uh, uh, all the things that I dream for. And I think that perhaps Jesus will be the, that kind of a king. He will give me what I want. And in God's economy, it's actually the opposite of that. In God's economy, all of the stuff of life is to be a conduit to Jesus. All of my, my dreams and my fears, my career and my failures, my, my, my family, my, my hopes, my wants, all of that stuff that, that truly makes up who we are as human beings, all that stuff should ultimately, can ultimately be a conduit to which I reach Jesus and I, I worship Jesus and I, I see Jesus as King and Lord ruling and reigning over all of that stuff, that stuff which isn't inherently bad until it becomes, takes the place of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Is Jesus the King of your heart today? Does Jesus rule that, that throne room? If not, then there are some familiar fake kings that, that, that move in. Maybe for you, it's your career. Maybe it's your business. I mean, what gets you up in the morning? What, what really excites you, makes your heart go pitter-patter like nothing else? Maybe, maybe it's your future. Sadly, maybe it's fear. Maybe that's what really like, just rules and reigns your heart now. Jesus wants to move in. Jesus wants to sit on that throne. 
Jesus wants to calm your fears. Jesus does want to give you a future and a hope. He wants to be the king of your heart. What does that look like? Galatians 2 says, says it this way. It says, I've been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who lives. It's Christ who lives in me. May Jesus come into your life. May Jesus be the king of your heart. It's Palm Sunday. Uh, let's, let's begin this week with, with, with a deep passion, a, re- a, renewed, a, renewed, a renewed commitment to Jesus, who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. Okay, friends, that concludes our, our, our time together today, but it just begins this exciting week for us. Now, I know you're at home uh, and if you're home because your conscience is telling you you still need to self-isolate, I respect that. But hey, if you think that you are maybe ready to, to get out, this is the week to do it. Let me tell you what's going on. This Holy Week is going to be a busy and yet exciting week for us. First of all, we're going to have a prayer time every day, Monday through for Friday of, of Holy Week. Uh, at noon, Monday through Friday, and, and at 7 p.m. on Wednesday evening, right here in this space. It's going to be quiet. It's going to be safe. You can pray silently by yourself. You can pray quietly with a friend. Come and join us. Let us pray. Uh, Let us us seek uh, the lordship of Christ in our lives. lives. Let us pray for family and friends. Come join us in prayer. Going on with Holy Week on Good Friday, this coming Friday, we're going to have a taquisa, uh, an outdoor taco party. Uh, And it's on us. The church is paying for it. Uh, We just need to know how many tacos you're going to eat. So what I need for you to do right now, I need for you to go to the website, riverchurchrgv.com, and I need for you to register, which really means I just need for you to put in the number of people that you're going to bring. Uh, we already have a, like a large number, but we can feed more. We just need to know that you're coming because we don't want to run out of tacos. That's 5.30 to 7 uh, p.m. On, uh, on, on, on Friday. And again, uh, an outdoor taco party. Join us from 5.30 to 7, then at 7 with our Tummy's full of tacos. We're going to come in here to the worship space, and we're going to have just a beautiful, traditional, dramatic reading, telling, singing of the Holy Week story of Jesus' march to the cross. And and, and so the story will take us all the way to the tomb. It's a beautiful service. It's an emotional service. That's 7 p.m. on Friday night. We'll go home, and then we'll rest on Saturday, and we'll come back Sunday morning for our big, our big, celebration our easter morning celebration at at 11 a.m we're going to pull out all the stops it's going to be an awesome service again what i need for you to do right now i need for you to go to the website and register tell us how many people you're bringing uh, to the the taco party i hope you'll bring lots of friends we will get the tacos if you'll bring the people and then I, I need for you to start inviting your friends, maybe on Facebook, social media, with a quick email or, or a phone call. Invite your friends who maybe don't normally go to church. Tell them, come, come to my church on, on Good Friday. Come to my church on Easter Sunday morning. It's going to be a rocking service. It's going to be awesome. I hope to see you there. I love you guys. I'm, I'm, I'm praying for you. Uh, I want to hear from you. You can send me and the, the elders an email at randy at riverchurchrgv.com. Now would be a good time to, to go to the website and, and give. Um, the way that we pay for our ministry here is through your good gift. So go there and you can give electronically. You know that. Many of you have been giving so sacrificially over the last year, this COVID year. And I really, I say thank you. Uh, we, we wouldn't be able to keep the doors open if it wasn't for you and your generosity. Okay. All right, well, hey, I look forward to seeing you at our prayer gathering here this week. I look forward to seeing you at 5.30 on Friday for tacos. Uh, I look forward to seeing you Easter Sunday morning at 11 a.m. Don't forget, go to the website and register for the taco party so we can have enough tacos and bring your friends. Love you guys. See you soon.